Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And a welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, crazy martinis for conservatives as usual. And, Jim, we start with the good as usual, and it comes from a Democrat, Kirsten Powers, who worked for Hillary Clinton way back during the Clinton administration. And she is now, of course, a Fox News contributor and a columnist and generally one of the more sensible Democrats out there. She has been pretty tough on the president on Benghazi, for example, and a couple of other issues. Uh, One of the other issues that she's speaking out on is Obamacare. She was a panelist on Special Report with Brett Baer last night. Here's what she had to say about that. Pretty much everybody except for individuals, who a lot of people who have really been sort of screwed over by this law, you know, who are left, some people without insurance or with extremely um, uh, expensive insurance. So, you know, I, I think that uh, Ron Fournier of the National Journal wrote something that um, ran today about, you know. This I was think, after he expressed himself last night on the panel. Yeah, so the headline was, you know, why I'm getting tired of defending Obamacare. And, you know, I'm going to say amen, brother, because it's exactly how I feel. People who have supported this law, who support universal health care, uh, are constantly put in a position of having to defend this president who has really incompetently put this together, rolled it out, and, and that's why he has to do this. That's why he has to keep doing this, because it's not working. The fact that uh, Democrats are starting to throw up their hands on this has got to be encouraging. The question is whether they'll actually help do anything about it. For Kirsten Powers, I, I sympathize greatly. She talked about how she had her plan that she liked canceled. It wasn't a... Uh, scam plan or, or any of those words that are being tossed around by Democrats. But I, I kind of have a word of, word of advice for her, if, she, if I could be so presumptuous. And that's that, Kirsten, stop then. <laughs> if, if you're getting tired of having to defend a, a program that's not working, then stop doing it, okay? It doesn't seem like there's a gun to your head. It doesn't seem like, you know, your family's been kidnapped and you're forced to defend something that's not working. And it goes for Ron Fournier, too. Nobody's making you write these things. What's interesting is that these defenses usually come in, I support the goals, but they're just doing it incompetently. You know, a very serious question can be raised. Is this possible? Or is it one of those things where you have you know, 30 million Americans who don't have health insurance, that getting, you know, a large chunk of them enrolled will be beyond the capacities of the federal government, not because the federal government got incompetent people in it, although it does, but just that those a good chunk of those 30 million people don't care that much that they don't have health insurance, don't really want health insurance, are kind of tuned out of everything. There was a, a CNN report about uh, folks going door to door trying to tell people out of Obamacare. And there was a guy who answered the door who did not appear to be joking, who had no idea what Obamacare was. And, and he, he, it involves caring for people, right? And, and like, and so there are some people, as strange as it seems to those of us who follow politics and listen to the Three Martini Lunch, there are some people for whom most of what goes on in Washington and politics and government completely escapes their attention. So when you say to somebody, you really need to go sign up for this, they, they won't understand why. They don't really care. You know, it, there's some people who just, just aren't going to be receptive to this. So this idea of someday we can have something where every single person has health insurance, it may be a very unrealistic goal. And that, that ideally we would reexamine that and say, you know, that's a nice thing to have, but are we willing to completely overturn the entire established healthcare system in order to achieve this goal? I think most people are saying, look, this is creating a lot of grief and aggravation, a lot of stress, a lot of headaches. And eventually, people will end up getting denied care because of this plan designed to help the uninsured. And of course, a large chunk of the uninsured are ignoring it or don't like their options on the, on the exchanges or find them too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, part of the problem, Kirsten Powers and, and Ron Fournier and folks like that, is that you guys kept giving the administration the benefit of the doubt for good intentions – and instead of, you know, seriously scrutinizing it and looking at the actual results, and here we are, and it's an absolute mess, and they have to constantly keep delaying things because they found them to be completely unenforceable as written on the books. So now laws are written on the books saying that by 2015, you must have ins- you know, provide insurance for all the employers of a certain size, must provide insurance to all employees or pay a fine. And that is now waived. Now, basically, the, the administration is entitled to basically say, there's a law on the books, ignore it is putting the entire constitutional system through a paper shredder, which makes it our good martini, um, <laughs> but in the sense that it's got the, the idea that Democrats with, with, you know, who aren't the most lockstep partisans are looking at this and realizing it is utterly indefensible. All right. On to the bad martini, which is always the fun martini when Jim and I get together on this issue, but I think we're probably going to be more in agreement than usual 
on this issue today. And that's the decision yesterday by House Republican leaders to offer up a clean debt ceiling extension that'll take us into next year. Many conservatives are furious that there were no conditions whatsoever, whether it's Keystone Pipeline, some sort of spending cuts, pick your item to tag along. And then if the Democrats rejected that, well, they're the ones that are being unreasonable. Ultimately, you probably end up with this clean extension anyway, but at least you you put the Democrats on the record. Others point out that John Boehner tried to put a couple of these riders on and he just could not get a majority in his own conference. So he decided to throw this out there and let uh, the Democrats kind of own this, particularly when they control the Senate and the White House. So, Jim, nobody on the right, I don't think, is super thrilled with this. Some might see the political benefit from from doing what happened here. But the bottom line is the debt gets worse and the American taxpayer gets hosed again. If you really want to look for a, a silver lining here, you can say, look, this is a circumstance in which the vast majority of House Republicans get to say, I voted against raising the debt ceiling. Uh, every Democrat who's an incumbent gets accused of, you know, they voted to raise the debt ceiling. And we avoid the consequences of actually hitting the debt ceiling. So that that's the you know nominal good news here. I, I do kind of think that there needed to be a more realistic expectation of what could be obtained through negotiations in this, particularly after the president has insisted for months and months and months and really years and years that there was no way to, he was going to negotiate on this. I had a chance to speak with Chris McDaniel, who's running for Senate in Mississippi on Monday. And the question was put to him, you know, what would you recommend dealing with the debt ceiling? And he said, obviously, he did not want to support raising the debt ceiling. Uh, and he demanded concessions and he would make, you know, if, if elected, he would do his best to make Obama make those concessions. And the concession he wanted, Greg, was for an across-the-board spending cut, including entitlements. Now, I'd really like to see that, too. <laughs> I'd also really like to see pizza and ice cream be good for you. President Obama is just not going to go for that. And you, you know, he, it's one of those things where you say, well, okay, then we'll hit the debt ceiling. Fine. First of all, I think the, the co- economic consequences of, of hitting the debt ceiling and, and defaulting on, on debts are pretty bad. Yes, Pat Toomey says you can shuffle stuff around, but Jack Lew and the Treasury Department aren't going to do that. I mean, basically, I think hitting the debt ceiling would be a big economic problem that the administration would relish because, one, it provides them some insurance for a lousy economy for the next two years. And then the second thing is uh, they'd be able to say, blame the Republicans, crazy Republicans. They tried to wreck it and all that kind of stuff. So what I would have liked to have seen, not that anyone asked me, (laughs) is to go through the pig book put together by Citizens Against Government Waste. And they go through and they usually come up with about 500 really god-awful projects, completely unjustifiable, you know, polishing statues in East Nowhere and, and stuff like that, and building Lego projects in order to help this museum somewhere. And basically just go, go to Republicans, go to Democrats, say, all right, pick 10. Pick 10 projects that are really terrible. Boom, cross those out. Republicans have gotten their symbolic victory on eliminating wasteful spending. Obama's made a concession that really doesn't amount to a lot in terms of dollar amount, and everybody gets to say they got something of a victory. I would prefer that to this uh, stance, but I'm, Greg, I, I put the floor to you to disagree with any of my analysis here. Pragmatically speaking, this was going to happen. Republicans clearly had no stomach for another fight that is anything similar to what happened in October. And there's certainly a political benefit, given where the polls were, during the shutdown last year, and the Republicans in many ways got bailed out by the horrific uh, rollout of Obamacare, and a lot of people forgot about the shutdown pretty darn quickly. The question I have in mind is when Republicans go to voters this year and ask to be once again given control of the House of Representatives and asked to be given back control of the Senate, this is a party that had control for four years, increased spending greatly. They're trying to be the party of fiscal discipline. I think most people, certainly in the middle and the right, would agree that they're more fiscally disciplined than the left, but their track record in recent years is not exactly strong. So what is the case? What is the argument to voters that if Republicans are back in control, the fiscal situation is going to be a whole lot better? Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, the fiscal situation will not be a whole lot better until you have a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican president. Okay. We had that from 2003 to 2007. Yeah. For Republicans in in control of all three institutions there who are committed to cutting spending. And sad to say that didn't really apply to George W. Bush. And I think we can say it didn't really apply to the Senate under Trent Lott and the House under Dennis Hastert during those years. And and that's just the way it is. And, And it's one of those things where it's always easier to argue for more spending than for less spending. No one comes to a, I guess, our opposite of a ribbon cutting ceremony, Greg, would be a ribbon tying ceremony. <laughs> Here's this giant federal facility that was built, and now we're closing it down and we're, we're, we're knocking it down. You know, there's no jobs in it. There's no uh, good press in it. There's no, no awards in it. 
that's just the way the dynamics of this debate are. And so, you know, the folks on the right have the harder task here. So if you want to argue that, you know, well, these guys haven't, you know, held the line well enough, I'm going to stay home. You can do that, but just be aware the replacement will be worse. There are some who would say, all right, let it burn, run up the debt, go right ahead. You don't get more people to listen to you in politics by staying home and being less active. We'll see how that works. I think it could be very interesting in some of the uh, primary debates, although right now it doesn't look like a lot of these primaries are shaping up to be the barn burners that uh, some had suspected. But there's still time. We'll see what happens. All right. On to the crazy martini now, Jim. And we always thought it would be hard for an anti-gun ardently pro-abortion Democrat to become the next governor of Texas. So how about a Democrat who's pro-gun and turns out darn near pro-life as well? At least that's the image trying to be portrayed here by Wendy Davis in Texas. Her story just gets better and better. This from the Dallas Morning News. Wendy Davis said Tuesday that she would have supported a ban on abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy if the law adequately deferred to a woman and her doctor. Davis told the editorial board that less than one half of one percent of Texas abortions occur after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Most of those cases were fetal abnormalities that were evident or there were grave risks to the health of the woman. She says if if those had just been in place, those little tiny changes, I could have totally gotten behind that. Jim, is there anyone who has uh, been listening to the Pink Shoes heroine of Texas narrative that's going to believe that? Every once in a while, you'll get a flip flop that really leaves your jaw hanging. And, you know, we already seen Wendy Davis touting her support for concealed carry. Look, it's not that surprising to find a Texas Democrat who isn't as staunchly anti-gun as ones in New York, Maryland. And I was going to say Colorado, but those anti- there are fewer anti-gun Democrats in Colorado <laughs> than there used to be, Greg, after a couple of recalls. When she does her fundraisers in places like San Francisco and, and Chicago and New York and Washington, you wonder if at those fundraisers, she says, oh, by the way, I'm staunchly pro-gun. Generally, there's a very liberal donor class that isn't so thrilled by, by having these issue differences. And then for her to say, well, I could have lived with a, a late-term abortion ban if it had, had you know, these little tweaks in it. Well, that wasn't what she was saying. You don't do that long filibuster over that kind of stuff. It's not an absolute total you know, reverse flip. This is kind of a, an attempt to nuance her position. You only make this stance if you find out that it's a political loser. Here we have a Democrat who is, you know, saying, at least she's pro-gun, saying she won't raise taxes, saying she supports fracking, and now, of course, uh, giving ground on her signature issue. As Charlie Cook puts it, stand with Wendy? For what, exactly? <laughs> I mean, it really comes down to footwear. <laughs> Do you think she just got to all – I think obviously her filibuster was part what she actually believed and, and part looking for the limelight. But then she just suddenly realized, oh, wait, I live in Texas. There's no way I can win statewide given what I actually believe here. Welcome to running from a district to a statewide. <laughs> I'm sure in her old state legislative district, that was a hunky-dory position. Amongst the national Democratic donor class, abortion on demand. At any point in pregnancy, for any reason, is not just a, a standard they expect that is a position they, th- they, they want to see celebrated. They want to be able to say that I support abortion under any circumstances at any time with pride. And Wendy Davis did that. Wendy Davis may not have kind of realized how much she was tapping into this viewpoint I find pretty uh, horrific. But, you know, like the, this, this is in there. So this catapulted her to stardom. And oh, lo and behold, it doesn't play as well in, in Texas as a whole as she expected. It's a terrible thing to base a statewide bid on, which is why at one point she did another filibuster, a shorter one, but that one was about education or something. So in one of her first fundraising emails, she talked about, you know, she stood and give that filibuster for education. And I actually had to go back and check and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. No, it was all about abortion. Well, she did that second one. So now she's not even running on the filibuster, which made her a national figure and got her on national news programs and stuff like that. So... <laughs> They're calling her the Charlie Crist of Texas, which is uh, a really <laughs> fitting comparison there. When candidates can totally flip on their what, what's considered their signature issues, what are they there for? You know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, the, the old weather vane is now a cliche of political advertising, but I, I'm not even sure it does justice in this case. So this is a genuinely crazy martini today, Greg. The Democrats have to be furious because the primary day is what? It's early March, right? So there's no chance uh, if they've basically cleared the field for her to get somebody who's actually reputable in this race. So... Greg Abbott might be able to, uh, if that's all he's got in front of him on the way to the governor's mansion, uh, he can play it pretty safe the rest of this campaign, I think. You're giving her like $11 million. There's no options there. There's no, there's no plan B, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> there you go. They, they have to go with somebody who is now, 
at least sounding like she's a little bit less, you know, adamantly pro-choice abortion on demand than she used to be. So there you go. Good times. Well, Jim and I will be hunkering down because Washington, D.C. is expected to get six to ten inches of snow, which should paralyze the nation's capital for a good four to five days. But we'll do our best to be together. Days try weeks, Greg. (laughs) All right, Jim, be safe. We'll talk to you tomorrow, hopefully. See you tomorrow. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us. And be sure to join us again on Thursday, weather permitting, for the next Three Martini Lunch.